when I see that, I view that, okay, that's my competition, then I'm really not worried about my competition in this space if, if people can't even answer the phones or call people back. So uh, the quicker we can get back, uh, the better. Um, however, it's that it factor or the, the really good salesperson that's going to absolutely get the deals over the finish line. But if you say, hey, Nancy, I'm going to call you back on uh, Tuesday the 30th at 3 p.m. Um, to discuss what we've discovered during our due diligence period and you never call them back, why are they going to trust you? They're already scared of scams. So I think follow appropriate follow up um, and just doing what you're going to say. Uh, you're going to do is one of the most important things of getting those deals over the finish line. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm your host, Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, and this is the podcast where we talk about raising private money without having to ask for money. Well, I have an amazing guest joining me here on the show today. He actually is a former hospital executive who actually retired from that, went into full-time real estate investing, can you imagine? Well, while he was in the hospital career, he actually held various executive positions, had all kinds of responsibilities. And I mean, he was in charge of total financial, all the operational control. And listen to this, in that experience, he actually oversaw budgets exceeding $100 million in annual revenue. And then he oversaw all the expenses and capital expenditure projects exceeding $30 million. Well, he took that experience being a hospital executive and he now uses that experience to run a very, very super successful land acquisition and development company that listen to this in just a two year period, he's completed nearly a hundred land transactions in multiple markets all across the United States. And in this interview, I've got a guest. He doesn't use any of his own money to do it, probably as well. We'll find out. But during this period, he's been able to implement very, very successful systems that actually automates his business. And it has allowed his company to actually generate over a million dollars in revenue in the past year. Now, he's got an amazing podcast as well that's called The Big Picture Blueprint. So in just a moment, you're going to meet my special guest, Mr. Mason McDonald, right after this. Welcome to the show, Mason. Jay, it's great to be here. It's great to hear your voice, Mason. That's what I'm talking about, right? There we go. <laughs> there we go. Inflate, inflate my ego. And I, as I joked before the show, my mom, my mom always said I had the face for radio. So here it is. <laughs> I'm sure the audience caught that right there. For, for goodness sakes, Mason, how in the world do you go from being a hospital executive, which by the way, I know the majority of our audience are listening to this podcast. They don't get to see you. I mean, you like look way too young to even be a hospital <laughs> executive if you still were one, but well, how does that look? I mean, how does that happen? How do you go from hospital executive making, I'm sure, Buku's money as a hospital executive, transitioning at your young age all the way over to a full-time real estate investor? How does that happen and why? Yeah, you're you're right. It's it's terrifying that I was allowed to manage an entire healthcare facility. Um, became COO when I was 24 or 25 and CEO when I was 25 or 26. And I, from, from the outside view, you could see, oh, I've made it to the top of corporate America. I did it really quickly. I had the right undergrad degree. I had the right graduate school degree, but I was exhausted and did not enjoy my career in life. I was 26, 27 years old, hypertensive stage two, sleeping two, two, three hours a night, stressed out all the time, didn't get to spend time with my wife. And I always wanted to invest in real estate where my, my dad owned a commercial real estate portfolio that he inherited when he was really young. So I never really saw him work. My great grandfather on my mom's side developed uh, communities in Boca Raton, Florida back in the forties and fifties. 
And so it was kind of in my blood. I was listening to podcasts, always ready to invest, but just consumed education for years and years. I mean, 10,000 hours of education easily over a decade. And I stumbled across the niche of land investing when I had saved up about 60 grand to invest. And I was going to invest in a townhome syndication. And the person that was managing the syndication said, hey, you know, this is what I do. I do land flipping. And he had a course and I paid five grand, took the course. And to shorten the story, I followed the system, thought it was dumb. I was like, there's no way this is going to work. And my first deal that I did, uh, I bought three parcels in Southern Colorado for 43,000 and I sold them for 185,000 and was nice. Able to... I like that ROI. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so I was able to quit my job, uh, primarily because my wife was the stable software engineer that, uh, managed the, the finances of the household. So I was able to go off and be the entrepreneur, but yeah, that's kind of the, the short elevator pitch of how I became a CEO and then how I transitioned into real estate investing and land flipping full-time. We're going to dig into raising private money here in just a minute, but before we do, um, we got a lot of listeners here on the show that are in corporate America. They want to be a real estate investor. They want to get into real estate, but they got this fear of losing the, the, uh, reliable, at least in their perspective, reliable, constant income. I get a paycheck every week. How does somebody transfer the mindset and make that jump? I think, uh, like a, 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 as a caveat to that. I could not have done it without my wife being able to make six figures in her job and support the house. So for the people that are not married or not very financially stable, um, this is not for you. Of uh, it, it takes money to be a successful investor, especially if you're, you're doing it full time. But the mindset shift for me, where I came from one of the most regulated industries, healthcare in the United States is extraordinarily regulated. There's yellow and red tape everywhere. You have to operate within very strict parameters. And so I was really excited to be able to be in this entrepreneur, entrepreneurial space where I felt like I could have unlimited freedom in how I operated. And I was humbled very quickly whenever I went from having 20 some odd direct reports and a few hundred employees under me to it was just me. And so whenever I, uh, you know, the first couple of weeks, whenever something needed to be done in my new land flipping business that I had just started from the ground up, I'd look around and be like, man, someone needs to do that. And there was no one there to do it but myself. And I was also humbled in the fact that it was a lot easier for me and my personality to come into an organization that's been operating for a while, see where the deficits are and implement the plans to effectively improve them as versus building something from the ground up, which I thought was really surprising to me of. I didn't realize it was easier for me to fix something than it was for me to create something. So I think those were two mindset shifts that I had to kind of figure out. And as the business became more successful, as I got more access to capital through private investors and was able to effectively hire and delegate and implement new systems, uh, it transitioned, but it definitely took a lot longer than I would have expected it to. And I really just want to drive home the point of don't do what I did and quit your job after your first deal, unless you're in a really, really good position. Um, but it's a, it's very different uh, moving from corporate America to this space. Right, right. Well, that, that's certainly understandable. Mason, there is all kinds of types of real estate that people can invest in. I mean, there's single family, there's multifamily, there's apartments, there's self-storage, there's commercial, there's, you know, on and on and on. And then there's land. Now, I know you just mentioned that someone you know, that's what they were doing. But I'm sure you researched, I'm, I think, I'm not sure, I would think you researched other possibilities, other avenues. So why land as yeah. opposed to all these other options? Oh, yeah. And I, I'd thought about every single one. And having the entrepreneurial spirit typically means you you have the shiny object syndrome as well. And I think for me, what I really liked about land was the lower barrier of entry to actually acquire the asset. And then two, uh, I'm, I'm essentially on, on a lot of these deals, I'm just flipping it, buying it for cheap, selling it for more. I'm essentially a pawn shop for land. And with that, you're not exposed to capital gain, gains taxes. You're taxed, uh, it's inventory. It's like you're a wholesaler or a dealer. So the, the tax um, 
advantage or lack of disadvantage compared to single family homes or you know flipping flipping some other uh, asset class where there's a physical asset was appealing to me. And then uh, beyond that, it was the multiple exit strategies of in coming up with business plans in general, you always have to look at the exit. And with land, if you're purchasing it at what you assume is a discount, you can either turn around and sell it cash or conventional. You can sell it seller, for night, seller financing. Uh, you can potentially do a subdivide or assemblage of lots if it's a bigger parcel or a bunch of smaller parcels. You can put in some level of horizontal improvement or just clear it, or you can go vertical and build on it. So having all these different exit strategies for every piece of land was really, really appealing to me of the worst, worst case scenario. And typically a lot of the land, you're not paying that much in property taxes. Uh, it, it made it a really, really attractive, active business to create as versus a passive business where I'm losing out on the tax benefits of owning real estate, where it's, you know, I've got a commercial building that we're converting into uh, uh, housing, taking two-story building, and I don't know, it'll be 14 units or so, where I'm going to be able to write off a ton in depreciation whenever we're finished with that, and then just long-term appreciation of other rentals and stuff. So active business, I thought land was just one of the best strategies. Now, let's go back a moment. Something you said uh, a second ago, you said there were some tax advantages to doing land. What are those advantages? Well, I, I guess it's the lack of a disadvantage, I should say. So where if you I'm not a CPA or attorney, so don't don't listen to to me. But this is how we've done it. Of we're considered a dealer because we're buying and selling so much land, and since we're keeping it as inventory on the purchase, it's categorized on the PN, profit and loss statement as cost of goods sold. And whenever we sell it, we have all these operating expenses associated with it, and we're just turning and burning inventory just like any other wholesale operation, like a pawn shop. So not getting exposed to that capital gains taxes and having the, the land sales just being taxed as ordinary income that you know goes through my entities and S Corp and pass through taxation, all this stuff that I don't understand I hire a CPA for makes it so where compared to say if I made 50 grand on a single family, family home uh, flip, I'm typ typically going to have to pay some form of short term or long-term capital gains taxes, depending on how long it takes. And I don't get exposed to that here. Okay. I understand. Well, let's get into raising private money. Since this is a podcast that's called raising private money, uh, raising private money is actually, uh, you've identified as one of your expertise, something that you're really, really good at. So let's start our conversation on private money like this. I've observed after interviewing hundreds and hundreds of investors that have raised private money, there's a common thread. Maybe it applies to you. Maybe it doesn't apply to you. But one common thread that I have uh, observed after interviewing so many people is that they were in their business. They were going along in their business for whatever length of time. And then something, quote unquote, something happened. Or should I say something didn't happen? And they were actually, quote unquote, forced into finding a better and quicker way to fund their real estate deals. And therefore, they learned about private money and they started raising private money. That's exactly what happened to me. Uh, I was investing in and still am single family houses uh, here in eastern North Carolina from 2003 to 2009. The first six years, I used a local bank to fund my real estate deals. Quite frankly, that's all I knew to do. I didn't know anything about private money, hard money, creative financing, subject to the existing note, on and on and on, wraps, wraparounds, whatever. I didn't know, I didn't know any of that stuff. All I knew was go to the local bank, get on your hands and knees, put your hands underneath your chin and beg and raise your skirt up for the bank to see your personal financial statement and all this and that. And uh, January of 2009, I was cut off from the banks, lost my line of credit, everything uh, because of the global financial crisis. And I had a great relationship with my banker, but then it's gone. So actually, that was the biggest blessing in disguise of anything that's happened in my business was actually having to find a better and quicker way to fund my deals, hence private money. I've got 47 private lenders today, eight and a half million dollars that we go from project to project to project to project on. What happened in with you, if anything, that caused you? How did you start? Why? Why? And how did you start raising private money? Yeah, I think uh, 
similar to you and so many other people of what ended up happening to me is I made all that money on my first deal, which was great. It gave me a bunch of cash and I felt really great, and really liquid. And then I went and bought a bunch of deals with all that money and then I was out of cash again. And so I had to wait for properties to turn around and I couldn't have any capital allocated to operating expense. And so, and then I would get a ton of cash in whenever I would sell these properties. And then I would go buy a bunch more and I kept trading up and up. And I was realizing that uh, access to capital was my barrier to scale. And the challenge with going to banks for the type of um, business model that I have with land flipping is banks don't want to lend on that. Uh, land is not an attractive asset class to banks to lend on for this particular purpose, because you're in, in the standard flip where you're not really adding value, uh, how banks who don't really understand land are incapable of calculating that LTV or loan to value. Even if you're saying, look at all this data, this land is at 40% of what the market price is. And you could lend on it at a hundred percent, and I mean it's it's secured against the asset, but they they don't care. Um, and so I had to go out to the the three Fs, the friends, families, and fools, and show them what I was doing, and show them my business <laughs> did you, models. Did you say friends, family, and fools? Oh yeah, the the three Fs in in private money is what we what what we've come to call them. Um, but I uh, thought I had heard it all in private money, and you just <laughs> gave me a new one. But go ahead. There we go. So uh was able to approach family members and friends and say, look, th this is what I'm doing. Uh, and for certain people that really knew me well, they were willing to give me unsecured promissory notes that I'm able to keep in the business and just pay them interest on it. Uh, and they're happy. It helps helps them get passive income at 10 plus percent annualized. And they love getting those monthly checks. And it started out as one year notes sometimes. And then they're like, can we just keep this going forever, basically? And that's great for me. And then uh, for joint venture partnerships on deals, I was giving up anywhere from 30 to 60% of deals of saying for the people that didn't know me as well and didn't know my track record as well, uh, where they would fund a deal and I'd give them a percentage of the profit. So um, it, I've changed my model a little bit and I'm better at raising money and doing it more affordably to myself and still making it great for my investors that are involved. But yeah, the, the, to answer your question, it was, I, I ran out of money and I needed a, a way to get it and the bank wouldn't give it to me. But um, people who knew me and knew that I was good at business and I think my corporate career and my success in corporate America made them trust me a little bit more too. So uh, yeah, that, that's kind of how it got started. And I think to date, I've raised through myself through my own companies about 1.6 or 1.7 million so far um, that we've deployed and uh, not returned all back yet. They're still live in deals, but in two and a half years now. Right. What's your favorite way to get the word out that you've got a way for people to get some really, really nice returns on their on, uh, investing with you? Um, how, how do you get the word out? How do you spread the word? What's your favorite way or methods to um, raise private money? I, I think it, my favorite way is, I mean, through conversations like this, Jay, where we're just having podcasts and I've got my own podcast that my business partner, Dan Habercost, and I talk about various deals we're doing and then just sharing sharing what I'm doing in the business. And whenever you share what you're doing on social media or LinkedIn is the main platform that I use, we people come to me and say, how can I get involved? As versus me going out begging for money, uh, people want to get involved and they want to you know, get in on your success. And especially whenever they're recognizing that, um, and th this is kind of a shift in mindset that I've had to have of at the beginning of this, I felt like people that were giving me money, whether it was through promissory notes or joint venture agreements, I felt like they were doing me a huge favor. And then I look at, you know, my market portfolio and watch what I'm making every year, just in the, in the stock market and index funds and other, other funds and stuff like that. And I'm like, I'm doing everyone a favor. I'm giving everyone huge freaking returns of like, I, I've joked with some of my investors on really quick deals of, hey, you made 64% cash on cash on this deal uh, in 15 days, which amounts to like 150,000% annualized return. Uh, so I think just chatting about what I'm doing and explaining that there are opportunities uh, to invest with me now and invest with me in the future. Um, 
it, it makes it yeah. fun whenever you see how much people want to get involved. Right. Well, and you just said something important. It sounds like you and I do it exactly like there, there's no begging. There's no chasing. There's no selling. There's no persuading. Uh, we're actually offering something for that people, first of all, most of them haven't even heard of, and that's what a private lender is. And secondly, quite frankly, there's more money than there is deals out there, at least in my world. Um, I got a problem right now. I got over a million and a half dollars sitting on the shelf that I'm not using in deals because I got more money than I can use. But you know what? I'd rather have that problem than having deals and no money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> so it really does. This world of private money really, really does put you in the driver's seat. So let's dig into your land flipping expertise. So we know why you told us why you focus on land. So let's get into the nuts and bolts a little bit. By the way, um, I believe that you also consult and coach real estate investors that want to get into land flipping and learn how to do it, right? Yeah, I, I do a little bit of coaching and consulting on the side. Um, that's not something that I do too much of, and it's mostly because I'm too busy in my business to do it. But uh, for the right people, um, I, I do have various offerings that I can come in and consult or, or help coach and get people's business off the ground. I do that mostly because uh, I've, I've got a small team now, but I miss the hustle and bustle of being in a large organization. And I love coaching and seeing people succeed. And then beyond that, I own a company where I now joint venture uh, with land investors or land flippers, where we come in, bring in, bring in all the capital and uh, we partner with you guys and myself and my business partner have done, I guess, between us, probably four or 500 land deals in the past couple of years and uh, being able to coach and teach people how to do it and then have them come back and have you to uh, have us fund the deals. It just creates uh, another integrated model within the business. So uh, that's kind of a fun side hustle that I do not too often, though, on the coaching right. consulting side. Right. Well, that's that's that, that's uh, that's interesting. Uh, just in case uh, anyone that's listening has to jump, I don't want them to miss out on how they can connect with you. So uh, tell Mason, our audience, how can they connect with you? And then we'll pick up with my next question on details of land flipping. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mason R. McDonald uh, is a personal website. It should have, I think, even my personal cell phone, email and LinkedIn link on there. Uh, so if you find uh, yeah, masonrmcdonald.com. You can find my links there. Um, but in terms of what I'll respond to most quickly in terms of social media, my, my LinkedIn, uh, that's where I'm most active. And there's the link right there. Uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. So you heard, heard me on Jay's show and want to chat about anything from healthcare to land to private money to whiskey or watches or just... <laughs> Just have a conversation, uh, whatever it might be. I'm, I'm open to it. All right. So uh, Mason's LinkedIn uh, connection is linkedin.com forward slash N uh, I N forward slash Mason dash McDonald. His website again is www.mason, M A S O N, the initial R, and then McDonald, M C D O N A L D.com, Mason R McDonald.com. So on the land flipping, um, Mason, where do you get your list and what are the best lists and how do you contact them? Yeah. So my, my entire business, if you listen to the next 60 seconds, uh, we target markets in the United States where there is growth and actual transaction volume. Uh, we start at the highest level of where are people moving, find that data on the census website. And then we go to third party MLS sites like Zillow or Redfin and look at where there's markets where over the last 90 to 90 days to six months, there's equal to or greater than sales than properties coming on the market. And then from that, we use PropStream uh, and we pull landowner lists, typically targeting people that have owned the property for anywhere from five or more, 10 or more years. Uh, individuals and trusts live out of state, out of county. And then um, we upload them into our CRM, which is called Pebble. And from Pebble, we send direct mail campaigns. And for those listening on YouTube, I, I've got an example of what one of those looks like. Uh, we send postcards, you know, something like this, where it's, are you planning on building on your land? If not, we'll buy it so you can put your money to work elsewhere. 
And in addition to that, we use a company called Lead Mining Pros where they skip trace uh, the data that we send them and they do cold calling and texting for us. And we get leads and from there we negotiate and close deals at whatever our desired rate of return is based on that property. But that's my business. Well, you did it in 60 seconds. That's amazing. Uh, you did it in 60 seconds, but now what's the level of understanding and implementation is a whole other <laughs> world for sure. Right. Um, so do you direct mail them that postcard more than once or just one postcard? It, it depends on the level of production within the market of uh, there's certain markets that we'll test out. And if we don't really like what we're seeing, uh, or we don't get too great of a response rate, um, we might not remail them or we'll wait six to 12 months before remailing. And then in the markets that are producing, we try to, we try to hit them several times in several different touches because you never know which marketing medium is going to appeal to people where today we've got an offer we sent out in Northern Colorado. We mailed them maybe a month and a half ago, but they responded to our, I think it was either cold calling or texting campaign. So we touched them at least twice and we're offering 245. It's worth probably five or 600 on that one piece of land. Um, and then we've had other ones where we've mailed them 15 or 20 times and they finally get to the point where they say, stop mailing us unless you're serious. And we'll say we are serious and uh, we'll get deals that way. So it really depends. Um, the cost for marketing is so low in general um, for what the margins of these deals are that we don't mind uh, a certain amount of duplication of effort. Um, but in general, in marketing, the more times you can touch your potential seller, uh, the more likely you are to get the deal. Yeah. I had a very, very a brilliant mentor one time tell me, Jay, if you're going to do direct mail, if you're going to mail them one time, don't waste your money. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. What's a good, what's a good rate of return? Uh, not rate of return, uh, response rate. What's a good uh, response rate? You mail out, you know, a thousand postcards. What's a good response? God, a good response is probably 1%, I would say. Okay. Um, and it, it really depends of, we, we try to keep it open-ended with our marketing. That's why we're doing, uh, neutral letters or neutral postcards rather than blind offers, which I know a lot of people in the land space do blind offers, which essentially means you're saying, I want to buy your land at one, two, three main street. I'll pay $8,500 for it. We'll close in 30 days. Um, I feel like we get a greater response rate, um, but probably potentially an equal close rate uh, using the neutral letters because with a neutral letter, you're able to go in and especially if you have decently professional marketing and it doesn't come across as super scammy like cash, we buy land cash now fast, uh, the pawn shop type marketing, uh, say that a piece of land is worth a hundred grand and you sent them a blind offer and your math was wrong whenever you calculated your initial offer and you offered them 29,000 say they would have accepted 49,000, but they see 29,000, they get emotional, they rip it up and they throw it away as versus something along the lines of, we're interested in purchasing your land. And then you are able to have that more open-ended conversation with them and just get them on the phone. Cause getting them on the phone is the most important thing. Cause then you can use your soft skills to attempt to close deals. Well, it's been my experience in real estate investing with single family houses. The more time that goes by between them responding and you getting them actually on the phone for a conversation, the less likely you're ever going to do a deal because time kills deal. You agree? Oh, absolutely. And land is less competitive in general. Uh, I feel like than single family houses. However, um, I mean, I, I own a bunch of land. I've got probably, I don't know, 40 listings live right now, give or take maybe a little less. And I get purchase agreements and postcards in the mail all the time for my land. And every so often I'll actually call these people and I've never actually had anyone answer the phone live. And I've never had anyone call me back before, even whenever they send me an offer that I'm potentially open to accepting. So when I see that, I view that, okay, that's my competition. Then I'm really not worried about my competition in this space. If, if people can't even answer the phones or call people back. So, uh, the quicker we can get back, uh, the better. Um, however, it's that it factor or the, the really good salesperson that's going to absolutely get the deals over the finish line. But if you say, Hey, Nancy, I'm going to call you back on uh, Tuesday, the 30th at 3 PM, um, to discuss what we've discovered during our due diligence period. And you never call them back. 
why are they going to trust you? They're already scared of scams. So I think follow appropriate follow up um, and just doing what you're going to say uh, you're going to do is one of the most important things of getting those deals over the finish line. 100% Mason. I tell, I tell people all the time, if you just haul your leads back, you left your competition in the dust. <laughs> like, you know, uh, I'm here in a small area, Moorhead city, North Carolina population, 8,000 people. Our total target market is only 40,000 people. And once in a while, somebody will show up to play in my sandbox. Uh oh! And I'll see a, a yellow bandit sign by the side of the highway. You know, we buy houses and a phone number. Well, I don't believe in competition. I believe in collaboration. I want to call them people up and say, Hey, I got money burning a hole in my pocket. When you get, I know they're a wholesaler. I know they're a wholesaler. They're not staying in the deal. And, um, I've never wholesaled a deal in my life. I ain't got nobody to wholesale it to. But anyway, I call them up and say, look, I got a, a, a money burning a hole in my pocket. When you get a deal on the contract, I want to pay you an assignment fee. I leave them a message and Mason, they don't call me back. Can I you know believe? they wouldn't. Yes, you I... can believe. <laughs> like what? Why are you spending your money on bandit signs and your labor and you're putting that stuff out for goodness sakes? So Mason, I got two questions before we wrap up. Next question. What is your magic formula that you're willing to reveal as to how you calculate your maximum offer on a piece of land? Ooh, uh, that, that, that's an interesting one uh, because it varies deal to deal so much, but the easiest way that I would do it or give, give advice to people that do it that are in the space that have, have enough uh, experience to raise private money is you look at what your cost of capital is and you annualize it and you look at, um, and, and then from there you look at the deal and you need to make sure that there's enough margin in the deal to uh, make sure that if there's any standard deviation or the market drops 10 or 20%, that there's enough deal for you to make whatever desired profit that you want to make, as well as pay back your investor in whatever anticipated timeline it is to sell. So say that your cost of capital is uh, 20% annualized and that you expect the property to sell within six months. And um, gosh, you asked me to do math and I'm like needing to write it down or something like that, but it's essentially. So, so you, do, so in other words, <laughs> you don't take tax value and offer 25% of tax value. Oh, that doesn't make any sense. That's you've just got, like, you've <laughs> got a more, you got a more involved formula as well, to how you come up with your offer. Oh yeah. Well, and, and because not everything is a deal and, and you can have more thin deals of uh, I'd actually never wholesale a property until this coming month. And I think I have 10 contract assignments that we're doing because the margins were more thin on it of, I didn't want to deploy my capital um, on these deals that were more thin margins, but I made the initial contract assignable and marketable and I had realtors and title companies willing to work with me on it. So I've got, I don't know, uh, 10 deals closing next month that will net me about uh, do some math here, call it, call it 40 grand, maybe on, on those assignment ones in particular, not my other deals that are closing. Right. Which my basis on that investment would have been close to like 290,000, um, which I typically wouldn't do a deal with that thin of margins of 290 K in cash and only 40 K in profit on it. Uh, so with those ones, I was able to get creative and not have that much capital in the deal besides my earnest money. Um, but in general, yeah, I try to I try to make anything work that it's a good quality piece of land. And if the margins are thin, do an assignment. And if the margins are potentially more hefty or it's something that I would definitely want to purchase myself, um, I just do that math of cost capital minus desired profit. And that that right there gives me that number. OK, very good. Last question. What's your favorite um, method of disposition, your favorite method of selling and cashing out? these pieces of land, you list it with your realtor. That's exactly it. Where I, I don't have to think about it where my acquisition manager brings it to me. I can take 10 seconds and say, this looks like a good deal. I sign all the contracts, title company sends a mobile notary to my house. My realtors already got it listed and with good pictures up and we get an offer three days later for two or three times what we paid for it. And we close in 30 days of those ones are great. They don't happen as often as, uh, <laughs> as I would like, but, um, and I had a few few this year that were like 60K profit, just easy, didn't have to think about anything. 
those ones where my realtor does all the work uh, and my acquisition manager too. Mason, don't you feel a little unworthy to make all that kind of money for the little bit of work you do? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm the one that, um, you know, learn, learned in my career what it takes to be an effective business um, operator. And I'm the one that took the gamble and the risk and put my myself and personally guaranteeing notes sometimes, which I don't do anymore, uh, and took on the risk and created the systems and business and opportunity and raised the money. Um, and to me, uh, with everyone that we do business with, we always tell them if for, for the sellers of if you want the highest and best dollar, go to a realtor, we can refer you. Uh, if you want quick and convenient, come to us. And a lot of times these people, they're, they're not desperate, they're just busy. And so we're able to give them the cash they want. We're able to make our realtor money. My acquisition manager managers making money, the title companies, and I'm making money too. And I'm taking that money and putting it right back into the business or assets that I'd like to own for the rest of my life. And, uh, yeah, I, if you start a business and you're willing to take it on, you deserve to make money. That's, that's America. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. So with that, Mason, thank you so much for joining me here on the show. Uh, connect with Mason at www.masonrmcdonald.com and you can find him on LinkedIn as well. God bless you, Mason. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jay. There you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Thank you for joining me here on the show and we look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide. And download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Conner.